It's coming. Okay. Um, and you know, the, the interesting mechanical properties of what you get out of mechanical and dynamical properties of what you get out of this. And I think uh, uh, this this has been stretched in various directions by what we've heard in the morning. So I'm not even quite sure how to think of set stock in this framework, but it should we be thinking of sort of phase and gradients of phase as the equivalence of taking something and making it a directed motion? And you belong to the same session in the sense that what does active matter mean? Anything which transforms shapes, color, is active matter. It doesn't have to be living. No, it's a, it's a, it's a, I don't think I'm suggesting it should be living, but I was just suggesting it's a, it's a system with a with a different degree of freedom that I'm used to thinking of. And the question is, can you get something new and interesting by thinking of you know, these degrees of freedom rather than motion? And, and for me, another new thing that came up today is sort of the rules of boundaries. Yeah how you attach yourself with boundaries, how you structure yourself with boundaries in both the, your talk and in Jacques Crow's talk in finite sizes and boundaries play such a you an important role. We, in, my, in my stuff too, the interfaces between the different orientations of the collagen fibers, I think you know, I, I think the idea is that um, we want to, one of the simulations that uh, Kate Storm, uh, one of our collaborators is running, is to basically look to see whether or not an interface of orientation can lead to a different mechanical property at that interface. And so I think I think the local sort of um, mechanics, I mean, that was one thing that I appreciated from Jack's talk, was that the local mechanics was, it was very important. Um, and I guess in the other two talks, you also saw these, um, uh, I guess concentrations of, uh, of, of stuff that happened at these interfaces uh, that were quite interesting. And I don't know if that's a, a common thread, but that's at least something that I picked up. So is it your sense that things happen at boundaries as a result of the kind of activity they were showing? Is this how structure builds up? It's, so we saw, for example, in Ashit's talk that basically you're sort of driven into the state where you have certain kinds of attachments and boundaries. And is that, is, so you were asked whether this is active in the sense of, is, you know, certainly in terms of just the, the matrix, the mechanical properties of the matrix is important. But is the same kinds of activity we heard about important, do you think, in setting up this structure? Yeah, I, I don't, right, so the issue of how cartilage is set up is, is pretty complicated. Um, from what I understand, in the beginning you have some sort of very collagenous, and in fact the whole bone is, is basically collagen, and then it um, ossifies from, you know, uh, or calcifies rather, from one uh, end. So, um, I don't know exactly how this whole signaling, uh, you know, takes place, but there is clearly a mechanical part to the signaling that I think we're going to hear about later in the conference and uh, certainly has been you know, shown to happen. And there's obviously a chemical part. And I think, I think that's kind of where we're heading, right? We have to start to understand something about how chemical and mechanical signals operate in order to, um, you know, really have a better understanding of these, you know, concepts. I guess, I mean, I guess if you ask some some people, they might say everything is chemical and, and all cues are chemical, whereas I think you can get very far with just mechanical organizations and mechanical um, entropic effects. Yeah, but it's also, a lot of but it's also, I mean, the other side is also not, uh, I mean, it's not all mechanical either. Right? Yes, so there's, absolutely. There's going to be this mix, and you know, it's going to be an interesting story to see how it all yeah. plays out. Is there some obvious signature of when something is sort of a more long-range chemical signaling versus maybe a local stress camp transmission? Or is there a way, an obvious way of teasing apart the difference between when you are... Because we've, we've talked today about local nearest neighbor interactions between things, 
And then also you have some sense of diffusion or sort of long-range propagation, right? Is there a signature? And can you think of ways of distinguishing which one is operating in a given case? Actually, the mechanical stress propagate much farther than chemical signaling. Yes, well, so, depending so on... So the long-range part and, the, and actually the fast transmitting part is the mechanical part, it's not the chemical part. Well, unless you have a liquid and then the stress propag... You know, the shear stress propagation isn't, right? So there's sort of different circumstances under which... Right. Yes, I agree with you, if you have a solid, yeah. yeah. But it could be different. Yeah. But actually, uh, uh, one, one important difference between, say, an active system and a uh, passive system is the fact that the active system continuously consumes energy and by that breaks the uh, uh, fluctuation dissipation theorem. So, the, 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 I mean, any system is very strongly constrained, close to equilibrium, by the fluctuation dissipation theorem. And there are a number of things which are forbidden because of that, which becomes allowed uh, the minute you uh, consume uh, energy all the time. And, and this is maybe the most fundamental difference between the uh, 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 you know, passive system, close to equilibrium, and an active system. Even though you can rescue, uh, in some cases, uh, fluctuation dissipation, which we also work on. But uh, uh, but still, there are. I mean, they, this is a very fundamental difference, and probably uh, I would take it as a, uh, a natural definition of an inactive system. And then you can you can do that in, in, a, in a huge number of different ways. But uh, yeah, and that, if I if I may add, I think I think that's absolutely right, and I think some of that seems to be a play in all the very different systems that we've talked about today. But I think in, uh, in the one that Nitai described in Kavinaj, that's why it would be very interesting to take away the cells. And because in some sense, so for, at this point, at least to me, I mean, it's a very interesting experiment, but I think it's not clear to me is how much is really just a mechanical structure of this layer system with different orientation and so on, or some input of energy from the cells or from some yeah. chemical reaction or yeah. something. So it would be very interesting to do what you said you plan to do, which is kind of strip it down in the various ways. Well, I mean, we know, I mean, there are some tissues, like we're talking about formation. Um, so one of the experiments that we're working on uh, with Larry's group is you take some uh, gel, some uh, stuff where you just have collagen fibers that are put in, and then you seed it with cells. And the idea then is that you let the cells act on the collagen fibers and form stressed networks. And so... And, you know, at the very least, the cells are important in setting up the structure of the network. And then the question of its mechanics maybe just comes down to, you know, what, what structure you had. But in the setting up, the cells are, are very important. Mm -hmm. Sorry, did I take it away? No, that's okay. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Out of line because I was trying to say something to follow up what uh, Jacques was telling uh, about fluctuation, dissipation, violation, defining an active system. So you, you did say that okay, a system close to equilibrium is something where you expect fluctuation, dissipation to work, and if you put energy into any system and drive it far from whatever its equilibrium is, there's going to be no fluctuation, dissipation. I could imagine a normal fluid that is sheared and thermostatic, and all bets are off. I thought that maybe for the considerations of the things that we are discussing today in this session, a better definition would be to say that the energy input has to go in in a specific way. That, that is, if you drive the system at the boundary, for example, maybe that is something that you should understand as a non equilibrium aspect of what you would think of as a passive system or something like that. Well, I, I also wanted to comment on the same issue. I, I agree with the plan. So, uh, an active system, uh, so a system far from equilibrium will not necessarily need to be active. So, a basic example of conduction, or even what we heard today about uh, granular materials, when you put energy into the system, energy dissipates in the bulk due to inelastic collisions. So a particle itself is not active, but if you drive system, the system will be out of equilibrium and 
I mean, the, I understand what you mean, but it turns out that this system behaves exactly the same way. On a long, on long, length, on long length scale, the minute you have a, a you know, dark dissipation, uh, for instance, if you, if you uh, vibrate uh, uh, rice grains of collections, they behave like active pneumatics. And so, even though you would say uh, uh, a grain of rice maybe in itself is not really active, but if you provide energy to it, and if, you, if it's a collection of that, they, you can learn things about uh, other systems which would be redeeming systems for some, some aspects, not all aspects, of course, but for some aspects you might learn uh, things. So it's, 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 not, it's not true that because the thing is in itself it's a dead system, but if you, if you uh, provide energy to it in some way, uh, it will begin like an active system. And, uh, so I guess this question is, if you don't use rice grains, if you use, you know, uh, billiard balls, um, do you, do you want to do you want to call that an active system as well? And this is a sort of the sense. Uh, of I mean, it's yeah. just a matter if you manage to uh, feed energy uh, everywhere. <coughs> that's the that's the yeah, yeah. That's, that's the issue. It's, it's, right. It's, it's, it, it, the energy should come in as noise. Yeah. Uh, yeah. I mean, yeah. As long as I mean, it can come in noise through the motors or the individual locally. Mm -hmm. yeah. 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 But then you're are you implying then that this issue of boundaries comes in because in 2D, if you're vibrating, then I can imagine each particle is getting energy fed in. But in 3D, then it's just coming from the boundaries, and then that seems more like just a really bizarre where you get things apart from equilibrium, but it's being, uh, it's being externally driven, not not each molecule is getting energy. I mean, is that a distinction worth making or not? Uh, not really. I mean, uh, uh, it depends on, on the question you are raising. But let's take the really benign instability. Take it. It's really benign. You would say, well, it's a passive system. I'm imposing a type of gradient, and I get some uh, some response. But if I if I want to understand the uh, let's, say, let's say the large scale behavior of the role system, now so I cross gradient, and I want to know the I want to write the the uh, name hydrodynamical equation of this role system. And if you, and, and uh, so which Eric did uh, uh, kind of long ago, and we did that uh, about the same time, he was just faster than us. And, and I think we did it in a naive way. And I think now, from what I know now, I think we missed terms. And if I was to rewrite it, I would write an active two-dimensional symmetric degree road equations for, you know, just uh, some kind of 2D symmetric, and we miss the active part. And, uh, and I, I remember discussion with Pomo, and, 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 uh, and we missed this active part at that time. And, uh, and I think now, you know, being somewhat older, I would know how to do it. And so it, it really depends on, on what, what are the questions that you're raising, and, and, and so even Beverly Benard, might give you uh, uh, active behavior. And then, uh, another example, for instance, if you just take a, a Langmuir film, and you, you are not really careful, and you allow for an operation through Langmuir film, which is the most experiments, that's the way it is. It's extremely hard to uh, control the, the, the vapor uh, pressure uh, on top of the Langmuir film. But if you allow for evaporation, this thing is an active system. People, if you, if you want to describe the uh, long-range dynamics. And there are good, uh, there, are, there are very nice experiments that show that. Yes, sir. Yeah. Oh, just, just a word. I mean, I said, I said something about breaking uh, the uh, fluctuation dissipation. But there are ways to rescue that, but uh, the there are, there are specific, I mean, for all Markovian systems, I can't show that you can rescue a fluctuation dissipation theorem. But it's, rich, it's, it's very restrictive compared to the uh, thermal one. 
in the sense that there's only one choice of variable which will give you that. Whereas for the normal fluctuation dissipation theorem, it's all choices of variable which will give you the, the, the fluctuation dissipation. So there's still a, bit, a, a strong difference. So, by the way, we don't, we don't absolutely have to talk about large global issues. If there are <laughs> specific things you, you wanted to ask and then I cut you off for, that's also fair game. I had a question specifically on the interfacial tension of cellular bodies. I'm wondering if um, the position where a cell division occurs is important in that case. In other words, I'm assuming that cell division is happening in the bulk of the cellular body, but is it, uh, if it were happening at the interface, would that have implications on the developing interfacial tension? So do, do I understand your question that they, one should treat separately that lay, this outside layer? Uh, that, well, that really depends on the, uh, well, in a sense, it would be the same for a fluid. Uh, the, I mean, it's again, it's only at some kind of cross grading level that uh, uh, surface tension uh, uh, has a meaning, and it's true for cells, and it's true for fluid as well. And and uh, and uh, so the general answer would be, you're totally right, that uh, uh, if you want a, a, a level of description uh, which. Uh, uh, takes into account the molecular structure or the cell structure, uh, uh, that very layer has to be identified and treated in a different way. So, in principle, we should uh, have a, a, you know, a discrete description for that layer, for instance, uh, which is a, a level of sophistication that we didn't really introduce. But uh, uh, this is, and if we need to, we'll do that one day. But, uh, uh, and, and it's really, I mean, it, uh, it's just the same kind of question that if you want to understand uh, nucleation in a, uh, 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 in fluids, uh, to really address properly the question, you have to go to uh, uh, molecular dynamics. I mean, the, the, this, this kind of, you know, uh, macroscopic arguments which I've been giving uh, uh, for fluids are just a rule of thumb which allows you to understand what's going on in a rough way. But if you want to understand in a detailed way, it's extremely difficult. I mean, Dan Frankel has done very beautiful things for nucleation of crystals, of colloidal crystals, for instance, and it's, it's very subtle. But uh, uh, if you want the global picture, I mean, what just to the answer is what we did is just a global picture. And if you want detailed pictures, it's orders of magnitude more difficult, even in fluid. Um, during your during your talk, you uh, proposed some alternative to the current treatments for cancer, which is to try to kill the cancer cells faster than you kill the healthy tissue. You said you could uh, possibly increase the, the steady state tension of the healthy tissue so that the cancer cells would die. Uh, and can you give me any any way of conceiving what that would look like? Because I have no, no idea of what that would entail. Yeah, I mean, I'm, not, I'm not sure I understand the question. Well, uh, what would it, it, it would probably take, I don't know, 15 years, 20 years, to uh, to give, uh, you know, to find what drug could help. I mean, the, 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 this one idea you could have is just crank up the steady state pressure of normal tissue. And but maybe it's naive because maybe if you crank up the steady state pressure. You also crank up uh, blood pressure, for instance, hmm. right? And then you're, you're you're not so safe. So I mean, there's there's a uh, years and years of work to to see uh, what is more intelligent and so on. So it's just saying there's one more direction to look at, but it's not it's not giving you the answer. I mean, it, it, it might be a wrong idea, 
but it's certainly an, an idea to be uh, to be proposed and, and, and studied. surrounding healthy tissue, um, wouldn't that just lead to a tumor growing in the healthy tissue? Because this healthy tissue is surrounded by other tissue. If you now increase this pressure, then it would just um, go to the other ones? Or? It's, a, it's a good point. You would have to increase all of the others. <laughs> That's right. And then, in fact, you know, the... Uh, uh, Oh, you could decrease your cancer. I mean, it's just it's, it's just sufficient. I mean, this this is the difference which is important. So, what uh, and probably it's easier to decrease. Well, I don't know. I mean, but but it's certainly when when direction to look at. I mean, if you could increase all the uh, uh, by by some margin all of the uh, uh, steady state pressure of the normal tissues, that that could work. Uh, and it doesn't need to be, I mean, this, well, the tissue must be more or less out there on aesthetic pressure. So, uh, and then you have signaling. I mean, what, uh, for instance, uh, differentiation between this, your uh, stomach cells and the esophagus uh, cells is due to acidity. So even though, so, so you may have some flexibility, for instance. Uh, even the, the, the pressure might not be really uh, appropriate uh, because maybe it's not so uh, important because it's really acidity which controls the, uh, the, the switch between the two tissues. Um, I, I just have a question about the, the idea of um, the steady state pressure. I mean, the idea is that we have a piece of tissue, we prevent it from expanding, and you have two things going on, uh, uh, division and proliferation and apoptosis, right? And the pressure at which that those ba are balanced is what we're calling a steady state pressure, right? But if you exert a pressure on a cell, you can get it to change volume. It will shrink down. I mean, is that accounted for here? Are we, are we allowing for cells to change size as well? Yes, I mean, uh I, I messed up the video, so I didn't have time to do details. I'm sorry. Uh, we, we we do introduce the uh, the size dependence. Oh, okay. But that's uh, uh, it. Just changes the game in my mind if you allow the cells themselves to compress versus only allowing. I mean, it, 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 they do. They do. Yeah. They do. I mean, you can see that, and uh, but it's uh, it doesn't change the the, the, the main uh, feature uh -huh. that at some point will stop. Right. And, and uh, so th that's one thing which, I mean, if you read the, uh, uh, the, the books on, uh, on, on biology, they will tell you that uh, at confluence, the tissue stop dividing or something like that. And, and uh, so inactivation at confluence or whatever. And at confluence, I mean, you have to put numbers. What does it mean? And, and it means that, they, I mean, of course, they are, they are dealing with rigid boundaries. And when they get to the, uh, uh, when, when cells touch, uh, uh, they see that, that some, they start to, to uh, uh, the tissue starts to, starts to grow. But, but if they were putting a, a barrier and measuring pressure, then they would be more, much more sensitive and we would learn a lot. And because somehow they, you know, you, if, you, if you have rigid boundaries, pressure cranks up uh, tremendously for slight changes in, in, in shape or in volume. And so I think it's just the wrong idea uh, to say that you know, they start, they stop dividing at confidence. May I change the topic a little bit? So one of the things that I found fascinating in Ashit's talk is you start seeing your movers uh, with the head and the tail. They actually jam at very small volume fractions, very low volume fractions. You start seeing them uh, form little clots. So I, I guess I, one thing was I wanted to ask, you know, do you have some sense of what the microscopic dynamics are that makes them jam? Second is, is this a lesson, is this something to be generalized? Should we be understanding that um, 
somehow in these systems with anisotropic motions, uh, should we be expecting jamming at generally lower thresholds? Is, is, is there, do you have some view or input yet? Something to say about that? It's a good question. It, it, um, so, so supposing you have things walking in the same direction, and would they aggregate more because simply they want to walk in a certain direction, come together, form a cluster, and that cluster is harder to break? Um, whether that leads to um, jamming at a lower volume fraction, I, I don't know the answer to it yet. Uh, clearly, I mean, in that case, you can stuff more particles into that in that space. We are still, you know, you, you observed that it was around 50 percent, 60 percent, and it was essentially not moving. But you know, perhaps one could shake them for a day or, or a week, and sure. maybe you would that have some nice isolated. Thing, right? So clearly, the volume fraction in which they seem to be jamming is lower than, say, the historical, where in two dimensions you can almost kind of get to. Yeah. This line packing is going on. Um, so it, it, it's a good question, and, and it's one of the, I, I would like to call that question. Yeah, there are the other so systems that um, you know in which directed motion always gets you stuck, of either in ordered states or disordered states, much lower than in equilibrium. Yeah. 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 Can you unjam by shaking hard is this question? Um, not necessarily. What, what you can do is maybe you can shake them so much that they may flip directions, okay, and then maybe it will move a little bit more. Uh, whether whether that means that it's now unjammed or it's just gone to a new configuration and it soon gets stuck, I, I don't know. Yeah. To, to find, find the critical point is very hard. Finish the sentence. But it, but it's a it's a general broad question which which in my very nicely framed whether these these uh, whether these directed motion movers will diffuse differently than normal diffusion um, perhaps not okay. um, and whether they will jam at a different point than they would if if uh, they were not uh, uh, directional moves. For example, if you had cohesive interactions, you could imagine that they would jam sooner. So is this uh, directed motion acting like a cohesive unit in the particle? Uh, say, think of different ways where you can argue on the other. So uh, while watching the movie, that you showed in the talk, I thought. Uh, so I'm, I'm just trying to clarify whether what I thought was right or wrong. With respect to the movies that Narayan and Menon and company had with the rods that moved both ways, it seems that in each shape they can, you know, turn, change the direction in which they acquire the long axis velocity. While in the case of the polar particle that you had, it doesn't change. It always moves in the same direction, right? Uh, At each shape. So, uh, so they are doing random walks. So uh, you have the polar particles. They also do backward walks. So, they, so if you ask a velocity-velocity autocorrelation, mm -hmm. it decays very rapidly. Okay. The direction in which they are walking is a much lower decay. So, mm -hmm. so it's taking steps, if you like, four steps forward, one step backward, left and right. So that's their natural state. Once they're inside a collection of other particles, of course, they can't turn around, so they, uh, so, they want to go Yeah, so there's negligible rotation diffusion of any sort, right? I mean, isn't the they keep going in more or less straight lines if you had one that? No, 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 there is orientational diffusion, and that is um, of order of, depending on the substrate that they are being shaken on, so you can tune that. Um, you know, full body lengths of motion versus half body length of motion. So depending, you can tune that if there's nothing particular so, about it. You just choose the length of the, uh, the walker. So if you are able to promote rotation diffusion by changing the um, subplane sub properties, right. can you avoid this whole jamming thing happening at yes, such yes. a low density? Yes, in fact, uh, uh, so that was uh, that was the difference between, if you like, the movies at the end where we managed to create enough noise and, and rotational uh, diffusion that they actually didn't go to the boundaries. Uh, whereas in the, in the uh, first. I'm uh, not thinking uh, of that uh, movie though. I think I'm not being very clear. I think it was a movie where you form clubs in the world. Yes. Right, right. So again, if you increase the noise, so if you should vibrate it greater, 
and therefore injected more noise to the, to the particles, then indeed they created more space around them and they could turn and they formed a uniform, more uniform system. So you could make particles aggregate at the boundaries or you could get a more uniform, weak swirling state depending on the noise that you have. So probably at this point we should thank the speakers very much and send you off to lunch. So we come back at two o'clock.